This week on the Backtable Podcast. One of the law suitcases that I was able to be involved with, not as a person who performed the case, but asked me to review the case, was in an OBL. And the patient had a major rupture of the SVC, major cardiac tamponade, and they had no nothing. They didn't even have a drain or pericardium effusion betrayed to open up to try to help. And the patient, of course, did not do well. So do the right thing, right? Treat, again, basic principles that we try to teach our residents and fellows here. Treat your patient as a family member. Would you do that in an OBL for your family member? You would not. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. BD provides clinical education and training through the BD Peripheral Intervention Advanced Healthcare Providers courses. The BD Advance team offers programs on advanced endovascular management of AV access, emerging techniques in the management of CLTI and venous disease, as well as many different resident programs and peer-to-peer opportunities. Contact your local BD representatives to learn more or visit the BD Advance webpage. RADPAD was developed by physicians for physicians. Clinically proven radiation protection during cine and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RADPAD radiation protection shields for all your fluoro guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on the Back Table Podcast. Now, back to the episode. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Behetti. I'm coming to you from Tacoma, Washington. My guest today is Dr. Marcella Guimarez, professor of surgery and radiology at the Medical University of South Carolina. Our topic today is sharp recanalization for chronic occlusions. Dr. Grimares, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ali. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. It's important to note Dr. Grimares actually created the sniper technique in 2009, and he has the largest experience using the power wire in sharp recanalizations in the world. That is quite impressive. That's a, a lot of responsibility on my side now. Well, today I'm hoping we kind of get into talking about sharp recanalization and we really focus on how you use the power wire in those tough lesions. So let's just start with what is the sniper technique? Good question, Ali. Thank you. Uh, The the sniper technique is basically you have a sharp recanalization tool in one side of the stump of a venous, let's say, that can be used for venous system, arterial system, or for the bile ducts we have used in all those applications in the past. And basically in one side of the occlusion, let's use the venous as a set, as, a, as an example, the venous occlusion. In one side of the stump, you have the radio frequency wire or you have any other sharp recanalization tool that the operator prefers. We prefer for many reasons that we can talk why we use the power wire and not other things. And then on the other side, on the other stump, you have a 10 millimeter snare. The snare is used as a target, so you can use that for guidance and also when to stop advancing and make sure that we just enough have enough to recognize to the other side, and then we can predilate to put stents, et cetera, bulimangioplasty, and we can talk more about the technique in detail later on. Perfect. Okay, that's a great introduction. Since we are focusing mostly on the RF wire, and a lot of our audience might not be familiar with the device, Could you just give me some basics about the device and how it works? Sure. The radio frequency wire is a guide wire that has the ability to give support to advance any catheters through, and it has the ability to deliver radio frequency energy at the tip. It's necessary to have a generator, which is a monopolar system, and the monopolar system, for by using one cable, is connected to the the wire generator is connected by a cable into the generator, and then a second cable connects a grounding pad to the patient's typically placed at the patient's thigh in order to close the monopolar system, the circuit of energy, so there's no skin burn, no other complications. Once that setup is in place, we just advance the 035 wire, 250 cc uh, CMs in length, 
there are three curves, the one of straight, which is the one we use most of the time. We can talk about the combination of what type of cath or what type of wire, but typically you have three designs of the curve, of the tip. One is straight, five degrees inclination, semi-curved, and then 15 degrees semi-curved as well. Got it. What size sheath does the device itself go through? The any 035 catheter. So five Perfect. French catheter works, four French catheter works. So we typically use a five French catheter. But because we're going to potentially use larger balloons or stents, we typically start a case with a seven French sheet. I see. Not because of the wire, but because of the stents that we're going to be placing. Sure. Oh, because of the stent size. Excellent. Okay. What are the indications for using this device? So, uh, first of all, we typically perform conventional technique to try to recognize the occlusion using, you know, maybe a glide wire, maybe whatever guide wire that you think is best, or anybody should think that way, I believe, to try to recognize using conventional technique with the best combination in your, ha in your hands. Once you've failed, uh, in some cases, we have about 15 to 20% of failure rate. There's some publication out there showing up to 25, 24% of the central venous occlusions failed using conventional technique. So around that ballpark number, those cases, when they fail, then we use the rate of frequency wire. Sometimes we tried ourselves first, the conventional, we fail, and then we, and that case is done uh, under moderate sedation. Then we stop the case and reschedule the patient to be done in the building where cardiothoracic surgery is available, where the best equipment we have is available under general anesthesia. Every single case is done under general anesthesia. And so that's the indication, basically, right? So people who are, uh, we fa after a failure attempt of central venous occlusion, recognize issues in conventional technique, one indication. Second, from the clinical perspective, is people who are symptomatic. We don't want to treat patients that are asymptomatic. So typical patient, let's say, with a brachycephalic vein occlusion, uh, has some collaterals, but they are not enough to decompress uh, edema. So ipsilateral edema facial edema, uh, SVC syndrome, basically, symptoms. And the other indication is for dysfunctional AV fistula or AV graft. Some patients might be asymptomatic, but if they have a dysfunctional graft or fistula because of central venous occlusion with low exchange pressures, then we indicate as well. So those are the indications in a... I see. Well... Can you walk me through your workup for patients um, where you end up doing a venous recan? That's a wonderful question. So first of all, we always have a, a central uh, a chest CT, sorry, chest CT venogram. And typically, we actually have two phases, uh, arterial phase and the venous phase, because we want to understand the correlation between the artery and the veins or the venous stump that we need to connect or the venous occlusion segment that we need to recognize with the surrounding tissues. So it's important to have an arterial and a venous phase for that reason. And once we have a good CT, we see these patients in clinic, we evaluate them, we discuss, you know, potential risks, and there are risks. Cardiac tamponade is one of them. Uh, out of uh, more than 100 cases we've done in the last uh, 14 years, we had two cardiac tamponades. We can talk about what we do today. We actually... The sniper technique has evolved over the years, and we have made some changes on the technique in order to increase patient safety and improve our outcomes. We can um, go back to talking about sniper technique in a second, um, and I will ask you some questions about that. But basically, the workup is this, is just make sure the patients don't have any coagulopathy. We check blood work. Make sure the kidney function is good. Some of them are dialysis patients, so there's nothing to worry about that. Chest CT, and we discuss... Uh, risks and benefits and complications. When patients come to you and they're already on anticoagulation, do you keep them on their anticoagulation for the procedure or do you stop? We stop. That's a great question. We stop 100%. And uh, the, the risk of bleeding complications is real. And I want to make sure that the patients do not have an increased likelihood or poor control of the bleeding in case there's a complication. So we stop aspirin and Plavix for five days. We typically uh, stop as it, 
standard of care, coming in for four days and the other oral or newer agents for two days. We're stopping 100% of cases. Okay. So walk me through your setup for, let's start, I think I, I kind of compartmentalize these into a couple different types of cases, right? So you have your iliocaval occlusions, and then you have SVC upper extremity occlusions. And then for iliocaval, you also have cases where they've been stented and the stents are occluded, right? So I guess what's your favorite flavor of that to treat for using the RF wire? I think every case is challenging. and I like the challenge uh, that those cases uh, provide to us. And I think the one that I think is more remarkable from the from the uh, response standpoint are the typical patients that are just very symptomatic with uh, AV graft or AV fistula with a uh, arm that is double the size of the other side, they have facial swelling, and they are very uncomfortable. Because of that, and you open up an SVC, for example, and put a stent and everything gets decompressed. This is, for me, that's the ideal si- situation, right? Or brachycephalic, for that matter. But central venous occlusions were typically, they are very symptomatic. Well, then let's just uh, focus our discussion on that to start with. Walk me through your case setup for that type of case. So we typically, as I said before, general anesthesia, the patient's in supine position on the table. Typically, we get access. If we, some some patients are referred to us from different states in the country, and we haven't met them before. So we are going to try first the conventional technique, just to follow, to walk walk the talk. So we try conventional technique, typically uh, puncturing the ipsilateral side of the symptoms. So the patient has right swelling, typically is related to a fistula or a graft, we stick the fistula, stick to graft. If there's no fistula or, or, or graft, then it's just stick any basilic or brachial vein, ipsilateral to the occlusion. And then we try to open up that central occlusion while using conventional technique, typically a glide wire or in a semi-curved catheter. And we try for 15, 20 minutes. If that doesn't, doesn't work, then we prep also the patient's groin. And doesn't matter, right or left groin, and we also prep the subxiphoid space, always, in every single case, especially, if, you know, of course, if we're going to do, I'm talking about now central, meaning brachiocephalic and SVC, we always prep the subxiphoid space. What I mean what I mean about prepping the subxiphoid space is to look with the cardiac or curvilinear probe, have that prepped and draped, turn on all the time. We have a pericardium tray on the side, handy. We mark with an axe exactly where the axis will be. We know the angulation or the probe that we need to get access to the cardiac uh, window to in case there's any cardiac tamponade. We take all those measures. We tell all the staff in what everybody needs to do in case we have a complication. So somebody's going to go around the hallway and call cardiology. One person is going to uh, bring the ultrasound a little closer because we keep the ultrasound turned on, but a little far away because of the big screen is in front of us, right? So somebody moves the screen to the side, bring the big ultrasound. Somebody else is going to open up the tray quickly, uh, the pericardium tray. So we have all that set up in place in order to make sure that we can be effective and rescue that patient in case there's a complication. How much time do you think uh, you have if you notice a pericardial effusion or pericardial tamponade starting? How much time do you think you have before draining it, before the patient just codes? I don't know. I only, <laughs> I only had two cases, so I, I, I'm glad to say I have no experience or minimum ex- not no experience, minimum experience with that. I'll tell you, I'll tell you real quick the two cases that happened to us, and 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 this is kind of uh, getting to the the evolution of the technique over the years. The first case was a we opened up an SVC. The case happened, I think, it's 2011, 2012. So we already had quite a bit of cases under our belt. I mean, about 35, 40 cases at that time. And what happened is we were putting a bare metal stent in the SVC, not covered. Today, 100% of the SVC are cover stents. We put a bare metal stent. Uh, There was a good result with the 10 millimeters. And at that time, I was very, uh, I was much younger. And my senior partner, which was uh, my chief at that time, 
he came to me and said, I don't think this 10 millimeter is going to be enough. You need to put it bigger. Make it bigger because it's going to be better. Because there's, there's a little bit of collateralization still showing. And I was okay, well, let me respect that. So I dilated to a 12 and uh, a 10 millimeter stent dilated to a 12. And looked great. The Really, the, the collateralization got better. We didn't have opacification of that. And then we just removed everything. Everything was okay. At that time, we didn't have electronic medical records. I was just, you know, signing the note and in the room. And the, uh, uh, our nurse said, your patient is not doing well, the blood pressure. And look at the patient's neck. His veins were this big, right? Cardiac tamponade. So we needed to rush and get back all in place, meaning get access again, put a balloon in the SVC stent, block the bleeding, get access, call cardiology, and then we're able to resuscitate the patient. Patient did well. I uh, went to an ICU for 24 hours and we did fine. But that all happened probably three to five minutes after I had created the cardiac. Oh, temperament. wow. Yeah, really fast. Because a long yeah. time, we, had, we, held, we already had held pressure. We, the patient already had a dressing on, I would say maybe five to 10 minutes, probably, yeah. be, to be more accurate. The second case, we saw there was an immediate change. So I think there's difference depending on the size of the hole that you create, right? And the most the most recent case, we was a long occlusion, was about seven centimeters occlusion, and instead of stenting first close up to the heart, I actually needed to put a two stents. I need to I put a stent in the most cranial aspect closer to the confluence of the right and left brachycephalic veins, I need to put a stent flush there. So in order to be precise, I didn't want to jail out neither the right or the left brachycephalic veins, and to put a stent right between the, the two, the, the confluence of the two, right on the top. And because of that, I prefer to put the first one to, to be most, most cranial one stent. And doing that, there's a tear in the lower portion of the SVC, and we, we were ready for the second one we put right away. And I had a partner, Dr. Claudio Schoenholz, that was uh, watching the case in the control area. And he recorded how many seconds we took to train the pericardium. It was 43 seconds. Wow. <laughs> so why why was so fast? Because we're so good in what we do? No. It was just because we were prepared. That's the message that I'll share with my colleagues here is you have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. We knew we had the pericardium tray handy, what I described to you before, ultrasound was on, we had the pericardial access, all prepped, marked, everything was lined up, the staff knew what to do. We just needed to say, please open up the pericard, the pericardium tray, bring the ultrasound closer and let's go. And that's why we were efficient to get that done. And that's what we do in every case today. It can be a brachycephalic vein, occlusion or SVC, we have the same protocol all the time. And the reason we do the same thing for the brachycephalic occlusions is because, as you know, the pericardium sac can go up to four centimeters cranially from what we call the SVC radio free, uh, ra right atrial junction. It goes four centimeters above. So even if you are dilating the lower portion of the brachycephalic vein in the transition with the SVC, you can still have a pericardium sac uh, tear and then tamponade. So that's our standard of care. We do that every time. That's a really, really great point is just being prepared for the worst case scenario. You mentioned a couple of things during that vignette. Um, you mentioned that the second case you had was with a very long occlusion. So do you what is the typical length of occlusion that you feel comfortable using an RF wire across? And then concurrently, what's the longest occlusion you've crossed with the RF wire? So the longest occlusion was an eight centimeters occlusion that we did actually a few months ago. But I don't recommend that anybody to start using radio frequency wire with that length by no means. I think the best scenario for anybody to start who wants to get involved in this case is to get a very short occlusion. Get a one or two centimeters, less than an long, preferably brachycephalic because it's easier. Preferably, I would say right brachycephalic, uh, brachycephalic, not left. 
because the left, we have the super aortic vessels and you're crossing basically anteriorly from a more posterior around the brachycephalic veins to the SVC. It's not a straight shot. We have careful, need to use 3D Combeam CT that I'd like to talk to you about the importance of Combeam CT in a minute. But I would, that's what I would start. And actually, it's important to be told one detail. We don't use the radio frequency wire activated every in, in every step of the segment that is occluded. Sometimes we use the radio frequency wire in different modalities, we say, I would say different applications. One is to get out of the vessel, so use as a tool to get out of the stump, right? And then you navigate without any activation, just going through, let's say, the fat plane of the retroperitoneum or in the mediastinum until we are close to get back into the stump. So use the radio frequency wire as a tool to get back into the vein. That's one scenario. The other scenario is there's no way to crow, to, there's no fat, let's say. Sometimes we have a very tight window between, let's say, in the uh, SVC, between the aorta, between the pulmonary artery and the lung. It's a small triangle of about one centimeter in diameter, and there's only fibrotic tissue there. There's no fat whatsoever. So there was no way for the guide to go just pushing mechanically. In that situation, we need to be active, advanced the guide wires slowly, progressively until we reach the, the target and with, with the RF wires active all the time. It's important to be told to our colleagues that wants to do this that we don't, we don't do the entire two centimeters, four, six, eight centimeters in one shot. We go every few millimeters or a centimeter each time. Of course, after doing this for many years, I feel more comfortable nowadays performing longer advancements of the guide wire, but I still don't do in a single shot unless if it's super short. And then as we progressively advance, we stop and check REO, LAO, AP, and make sure we are on the trajectory, right? Because as you go, the radio frequency wire, radio frequency wire can deflect, especially if you have fibrotic tissue. Okay, so short throws um, and then checking with fluoroscopy yep. mainly. Do you um, do short throws and then switch to a different wire to see if it sails, or do you just see if the Bayless wire will sail? I always use the. I try not to lose territory. I think that's a dangerous, dangerous principle. I like to advance the power wire itself and see if it goes through. If it goes through, any wire will go. And that's why I try for to do that. And then I, I try to not activate the radio frequency if I don't need to. And again, use more as free entry tool when we get to the other side. One one quick thing I want to mention, you emphasize, you kind of repeated me saying, okay, you do obliques to check every few millimeters each time. Yes, and we also use Combeam CT once, twice, three times, as many times as needed. In case we have a very complex case that I need to know exactly where I am. And this is critical. Uh, we do not save radiation from that standpoint in order to make sure we are safe. The other day we did a case that the, the trajectory that it needed to go was from anterior to posterior in the mediastinum. So we were in different planes. And the window that I had was about nine millimeters between the aorta, pulmonary artery, and the lung in a non straight shot at all. So in that case, we need to go a few millimeters each time, checking in in obliques. And I did two spins to make sure that I was not hitting the pulmonary artery. And we ended up doing very well, but we took the time to do that step in order to make sure the patient was was safe. Well, it, it seems to me kind of once you make a trajectory with the RF wire, like uh, once you've turned it on and gone through a certain thing, you can't take it back, right? Like, does the wire just want to keep following that path you made, or is there any rede redirectability? You can redirect. That's a great question. You can't redirect, actually. What you need to do, and that's in my hands, again, works for me. It's not the only way to do it, by no means. Different people probably have different preferences. Is is to use a semi-curved catheter, like a Tegmeyer or a Kumpi catheter tip, semi-curved, with a straight RF wire. If I'm going to be going crossing, crossing, for example, the left brachycephalic or even the, in the iliac system that you have the more 
a more superficial to a deeper and then a curved uh, plane, you might need a semi-curved catheter with the semi-curved RF wire. And then adjust the two, and then you can kind of go traveling through the trajectory that you design up front. That's really, really amazing. Can we just talk a little bit about how you mentioned the sniper technique has evolved since you invented it? Well, I think the, first of all, we have improved in safety. That's the first. We never change our the, the, our protocol in terms of trying first conventional technique. That's the most important thing to be told. We don't want to perform a potentially risky complication that if you can resolve with a you know, good glide wire, a good technique that, that works for you, Ellie, and, and not use anything risky. So first of all, to emphasize, conventional techniques should prevail, should be attempted every single time. Second thing, we never change the indication. Patients that are symptomatic, patients who have a dysfunctional AV fistula or AV graft, dialysis axis, basically. What we did change is in the SVC, we only use cover stent, and we do everything we can to prevent blocking collaterals such as the azygous vein that is an important collateral uh, if we can. So there are si situations that you cannot, you have to cover the azygous vein, but in the majority of the cases, the azygous vein is actually what preserves the stump open. That's the end of the stump, exactly where the azygous takeoff is or, or drainage is. And then we try to be uh, use a balloon expandable, not self-expandable stent. We try to be precise and preserve that important collateral. Not to mention that if the patient has, uh, let's say, one brachycephalic that is blocked and the other one is open, with the SVC open, we try to be meticulous in avoiding jailing out the contralateral brachycephalic vein as well. You can use, if there's that existing catheter, we leave it there as a reference, the existing dialysis catheter. We can do a venogram as a mapping. We can put another wire as a map, as a, as a reference. I mean, there are many tricks, as you know, to make sure we know where we need to park our stent. I, this is a, a situation that I've encountered um, is you know you have to jail off one of the brachiocephalic veins. How often do you encounter that? Or are you always able to keep both brachiocephalic veins as your inflow? No. If I was going to, if one side is open, I'm going to do all that I can to prevent that from getting jailed out. And I would say 99% of the time, if one side is open, we try to avoid crossing with the stent. And of course, that's one of the reasons why in the brachycephalic segments, we use bare metal, balloon expandable, bare metal stent, because some of the struts, sometimes the strut can project a little bit into the brachycephalic, let's say two or three millimeters, but we're not interfere with the flow. The flow is still can go through the struts of the stent, right? Got it. Okay. That's, so that's really important for uh, me to understand. So you use a covered balloon expandable stent in the SVC and then an uncovered balloon expandable stent in the brachiocephalic veins. Yes, because also we don't want to jail out the flow coming from collaterals in the mediastinum or a cervical branches. If you go a little higher and you should always try to avoid to stand above the costoclavicular junction because of the trauma, right? Because of the external compression by the pinch effect and metal fatigue and metal fracture uh, that can occur in that segment of, of the body. So we always, always, we always try to stay away or avoid crossing. That's the, the message, the costoclavicular junction. Absolutely, yeah. Well, can I mention one more thing about the, the, the changes in the technique? One, one change was we always do break uh, subxiphoid space or uh, zone prep, prep and drape, as I mentioned, with ultrasound turn on, pericardium tray handy all the time. That, that was one evolution of our technique. The second thing we did is, it to me is very, it's a small detail, but we think it's very important. Once we cross with the radio frequency wire using a 10 millimeter snare, we snare out and then we use a body floss technique. So we have a 200, 250 centimeters long radio frequency wire through and through, either IJ or arm, and then getting out through the patient's femoral vein. We use a 125, 130 centimeters catheter, five French catheter to exchange that wire for a 260 amplet stiff. Once we have that in place, 
here comes a big change that we created in the last few years, especially if it's SVC. Because there is a risk on the SVC that once you open up, and by the way, we predilate with a four millimeter balloon only. Never go bigger than that. It's not necessary. And once we predilate with the four millimeters, we don't we prefer to predilate and over the same guide wire, that's the trick, is to come with the cover stand ready to go over the same guide wire from the other direction. Interesting. Okay. So let's say if you're getting axis in the right arm, for example, and femoral is the other axis, we leave the shorter segment of the guide wire on the patient's arm side. We use a 75 centimeter shaft balloon, four millimeter balloon, 75 centimeter shaft, something short because there's less wire outside of the body here and leave the longer wire throughout the femoral side. So we can come up with uh, the, the stent and typically the stent comes up with uh, 120, 130 centimeter shaft, the cover stents, balloon expandable cover stents. And then over the same wire, we predilate and in a matter of a second, we deflate, pull back and come up with a stent with the area to be stented already marked on the screen with a pen or use roadmap, whatever one you want to do to be safe. So there's no time for cardiac tamponade. Brilliant. Yeah. How do you size your stents in the SVC? Wonderful question. That's another thing about the evolution or the, or the, or the progression of the technique. Uh, at the beginning, uh, especially when I was younger, starting to do interventional as a younger faculty here at MUSC, I was using, you know, 12, 14 millimeter balloons for the central veins. And quickly, quickly we learned that you do not, and that's again works for us. It's not the only way to do by no means, right? Uh, I'm not trying to be dogmatic here. I'm just share with you our practice. We do not use bigger than 10 millimeter stents. And over the years, we learned that you don't need to open bro both brachiocephalic veins either. You should always try to open up the brachiocephalic vein that is ips lateral to the occlusion or the symptoms. Uh, sorry, not to the occlusion. Si uh, ips lateral to the, if the patient has bilateral, let's say upper extremity swelling, but you have a fistula on the right side, you should try to open up the right brachiocephalic. If the fistula is on the left side and both are occluded, both brachiocephalics are, are down, you should try to open up the ipsilateral brachiocephalic vein. But you do not need to open up both, even if the patient has facial swelling, only one side is enough to be open and 10 millimeter stents. That brings another discussion, which is how do you size your stent in terms of do you use a if there is a, a stump above the occlusion of 14 millimeters, the brachiocephalic, the SVC is gone. Are you going to use a 14 millimeter stent? No. You're going to use a 10 millimeter stent. Because the stent is going to be trapped by the occlusion, which is typically chronic. You don't need to open up to 14 millimeters. Then brings another discussion, which is why to use IVUS. We have not even talked about IVUS yet, which is my favorite thing to talk about when you're talking about venous recans. But Right. Yeah. Do you use IVUS in your cases? No, no. And, and, and I don't see a reason to use IVUS. And, and, and I, I'm, again, works. That's the way we do only for us. It's one way to do it. It's not the only way to do it uh, by no means. But I'm just debating with you for a moment here. Why to use IVUS if the vein is reactively dilated, over dilated than is typically is? And once you open up that vein with the 10 millimeters, the vein is going to shrink, is going to decompress, is going to, to go back to its normal size. Why are you going to measure based on oversize that is artificially? Sure. I, I see your point. Why to dilate to 12, to 14, to 16, if the vein normally, let's say, is between 10 and 11 millimeters, for example? <laughs> I, under, I understand what you're saying about not using IVUS for sizing. I personally think IVUS is useful just to make sure you haven't gone through anything important um, and to help decide your landing zones, which you could also do with venography, right? But no, that's I like see the your, counterpoint to that. I see your point. I, I see your point. But I think more important than ICE or IVUS is to potentially put an, a transesophageal echocardiogram. If you really are concerned about that, 
I think that's safer to show you the window between the heart, the lung, the, the pulmonary artery. It's going to give a better uh, visualization. I don't use that in routine, and I never actually never used ice or IVUS to show me the where I need to go. I have done many times though, and that's our another aspect of the change of the progr- of the evolution of the technique. What we do today almost in routine, unless if the case is super straightforward. Again, two centimeters, three centimeters occlusion of the brachycephalic, right brachycephalic vein, straight shot. That's the best case, the simplest case. Anything else, we always do a combi MCT at the beginning of the case, and we inject from the axis from above, axis from below, can be injected from the heart in case it has SVC occlusion, or from the SVC in case of brachycephalic occlusion, and you do a, a combi MCT with injection, with the dual injection. Find really well the two stumps and the surrounding tissues, like brachycephalic artery. Sometimes a brachycephalic artery on the right side would be very curvy, and, and in that curvature, you actually are on the same plane or where to where do we need to recognize. You have to be very careful there. Of course, you are anterior, posterior in relation to that, but from the 2D standpoint, the brachycephalic vein is crossing exactly where you want to cross. Also, or sometimes, uh, depending on the brachycephalic venous occlusion, you might need to actually have the patients in expiratory breath hold while you are activating the RF wire because the lung can be on the way in hyperextension, in hyperexpansion of the of lung. The lung actually can move and be on the way of your recognition track. So you need to ask, ask your anesthesiologist to have an expiratory breath hold, and then the lung is out of the way, then you can fire and open up the uh, space. So there's a little, a lot, a lot of details that the Combeam CT will give you. I don't think the eyes will give that level of, of detail. That's absolutely true. Yeah, that's good to know that you do the cone beam at the beginning of the case um, with contrast, so you just totally plan what you're going to do. Okay. Man, this is kind of veered off my outline, but I'm super excited because I'm like learning so much from you. It's amazing. No, 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 no. You have experience too. <laughs> well, we talked a lot about upper extremity SEC cases, brachiocephalic cases. Do you ever use it for lower extremity cases or arm cases? I never use in the arm and I never used uh, in the venous ass side of the lower extremity below the grind. We have used in several cases for IVC reconstruction. We had a few cases of patients with IVC agenesis. Uh, they were born without a cava, and we were able to recognize. I'm talking about patients with a big chronic venous ulcers for years without healing, despite all the skin care and wound care that they had, and we were able to open up. Some other pe- pe- people, they simply had dialysis catheters in the lower extremity, whatever and they had occlusion. So we use in those cases. What I have used below the grind is on the arterial side is, but that's another chapter, another conversation, because that's, that's, we can use in the iliac arteries we have used, we have used in the SFA. The problem is the radio frequency wire seems to not work well when they need to cross calcification. There's not cross calcification at all. So you need to use as a re-entry tool, uh, but not where the calcium is. And that's, but that, that can be super helpful in that scenario as well in the, SP, in the SFA. That's an innovative use for the RF wire. This is a question from uh, one of our audience members. Do you use laser at all in your practice? And any insights as to differences between power wire and laser for venous occlusions and then for arterial occlusions as well? I don't use laser. And we used back in 2008, 2009, and we had a lot of complications and fistula creations, extravasation using laser. So I don't think it's a well-controlled system for sharp, as you to you be used as a sharp recognition technique. I'll be very, I'll be very concerned about that. The same reason why we don't use, for example, the colapintonil to use the for a sharp recognition as some other people use the colopinto needle all the time. We don't because I prefer to have refined control on the advancement of the tool. Meaning that if you advance the RF wire carefully a few millimeters each time and you can preset on the generator, you can have continuous mode or 
a pulse mode, and you can have one second, two seconds. Typically, now I feel very comfortable with the technique, so we use continuous mode for two seconds. If I was gonna start, I'll probably use pulse mode for one or two seconds. So the, the, the activation will be a very short period of time, and you go a few millimeters each time in order to progressively advance the RF wire safely. And on the other hand, the, the Colapinto needle, anybody who wants to go through a chronic complex occlusion, you need to put a lot of force, as you know, to advance the needle. And then you don't want to have the oops moment in the case that's, oh, I went too far. So the radio frequency wire, in my hands at least, provides, again, refinement on the advancement of the needle, more, no, of the guide wire, more controlled than to push a colapinto needle against a very, sometimes very fibrotic, a scarred venous occlusion. It sounds like, yeah, it sounds like there is a learning curve with the RF wire, but once you get there, it, it ends, tends to be safer. So um, I know you've been doing this since 2009 or even before that, but how many cases would you say you had to do before you felt pretty comfortable with the RF wire? I think anybody who has a lot of experience like yourself, I think you should do, I don't know, maybe five, 10 cases, I think you'd be very comfortable. Yeah, and, and, that's and, awesome. And, and it's, all, it's all about uh, the good indication. I, w I would emphasize that, right? Good indication, meaning have a small, uh, not a small, but a short occlusion. Start with the right brachycephalic vein, not SVC, long occlusions, not brachycephalic because of the curvature between the, the, the let's say, costoclavicular segment to the SVC can be very curvy. Sometimes you have about 10, 12 millimeters window between the sternum, between the sternum and the supraortic vessels. And that's the plane where you need to travel with the RF flyer to connect the two stumps. So I would not I would discourage anybody who wants to start using long using that in long occlusions, uh -huh. SVC and brachycephalic on the left. Gotcha. Perfect. This is also a whole nother topic, but could you just touch on the non-vascular uses for the RF wire? Sure. Uh, great question. We actually, the first publication we had, I uh, don't remember what year now, but uh, it was the use, the application of the radio frequency in the bio ducts, actually. And we had uh, several cases of, of benign strictures, not malignant strictures, benign strictures post-transplant uh, or post colidocodigenostomy that we had nothing we can do, we could do. We tried multiple techniques, multiple times, decompressed the bile duct, et cetera, but we're not able to get access into the jejunum. So in those cases, we public, I don't remember how many we've done, but uh, we published a case series of six cases that were successfully crossed. And that's another application that you could be tried. The other thing that I did not try yet, but in theory could be used, is to use the rate of frequency wire to recognize the ureter that is potentially scarred, or there's an amputation of the ureter in one side and you have a stump on the other side, you could potentially in the retroperitoneum cross as long as, you know, as, lo as a short segment that could be also used. But again, you need to work potentially in, a, in collaboration with urology to put a snare on the other side Use, the, use it as a target or, or simply contrast the other side and then using AP, RAO 30 degrees, LAO 30 degrees or a spin or a combi CT to see where the target is and make sure you are aligned, right? Before you activate the RF wire. That's, yeah, that's amazing. That's a really great uh, application. Um, I'd be interested to know if other folks around the country have tried it in the ureteral system. Any downsides to trying to do uh, uh, RF recanalization in the biliary system in a malignant setting? You have to be careful with the level where the occlusion is because that's an area where you have, I mean, similar to the central venous occlusion where you have the aorta and the pulmonary artery and the lung, right? Just that. But, but you have the portal vein, you have hepatic artery, right? You have potentially changes in the anatomy post uh, partial hepatectomy, uh, bowel adhesions, bowel closer on the way. So we have to study the anatomy really well. One of the things we like to do is to have a uh, ask the patient to ingest barium uh, or simply iodine or contrast, regular contrast the day before 
So we can opacify all the small bow or the colon, etc. So we can have an idea where the target is, and then we can poke coming from percutaneous axis, again, bile duct, right? We can have uh, the RF wire on the stump and then sometimes not using any target on the other side, just the contrast that is in the small bow as long as relatively close, and then use that as a target. The other thing we have done is to use a Shiba needle, a 23 Shiba needle, uh, get, poke the uh, small bow close that we know by axoimaging that is close to that stump and then pulling back slowly injecting contrast. Then once we are in the bow, opacify with a lot of contrast and then direct puncture with direct infusion of contrast instead of giving PO the day before. Sure, yeah. But we need to have a target in other words. Right? You don't want to be poking without a target, of course. Well, one of your former fellows um, mentioned to me that you uh, have been a med mal defense expert witness several times. What kind of bad outcomes have you seen related to sharp recanalization in cases you've reviewed? So I think the important comment to make uh, to the audience, audience here is to not use the sniper technique in an OBL. Okay. <laughs> it's a very, seems, uh, that's a really good point. Yeah. It seems to be an obvious thing to you as you were laughing here a second ago. But in reality, one of the lawsuit cases that I was able to be involved with, what not as a, not as a person who performed the case, but asked me to review the case was in an OBL. And the patient had a major rupture of the SVC, major cardiac tamponade, and they had no, nothing. They didn't even have a drain or pericardium effusion, betray to open up, to try to help. And the patient, of course, did not do well. So do the right thing, right? Treat, again, basic principles that we try to teach our residents and fellows here. Treat your patient as a family member. Would you do that in an OBL for your family member? You would not, right? So I think that's, if we can deliver that message, is good out there. That's, that's a really good point. Any other you know, kind of bad outcomes you've seen related to sharp recanalization in the community, maybe done at the hospitals, like places where people go wrong? Yeah, what I heard, I didn't witness, but I heard is that uh, another colleague in the past ended up recanalizing an SVC occlusion and any time that he was dilate, pre-dilating, the patient was going a systole. So probably- That's a bad sign. Yeah. So probably that's a little concerning, right? So I think, and then he aborted the case, wisely done, aborted, backed off, and the patient apparently did well. But then he called me after the case and said, what happened here? Well, you probably hit the sinusoidal node when you tried to cross, when you crossed with the RF wire. And that's one of the reasons why you need to take the time to find, if you're recognizing the SVC, try to find the stump, right? At the end of the stump, take the time. Don't simply poke from anywhere in the right atrium. Try to find really well where the stump is. And then from there, you walk your way through with the RF wire. I usually send, I always say there's two ways to recognize. It can come from above or it can come from below. And, and let's spend a second to talk about that for a moment because there's a technical detail. When you are coming from below, from the heart, let's say SVC, because of the heartbeat, the RF wire is going to be always in an unstable situation, right? It's always moving from the target. So uh, in that situation, what I like to do is to use a long sheath, let's say a 65 destination sheath, park the catheter, don't go too far because it can perforate. That's another complication I heard. Some people were, well, not complication with the RF wire, but just having a long sheath and forcing the sheath against the stump in the heart created a tar cardiac tamponade. So delicate, careful, push the sheath against uh, close to the stump, not against the stump, but close to the stump or to the, to the right atrium uh, that is occluded. And then from there, use a semi-curved catheter with a straight RF wire. That's one way to do it, and you have way more stability. From above, you have total stability. There's, it's all, uh, there's no movement, but you're typically going against the heart and then you, you, you could be in a situation that if you don't have a good snare in a good place, a 10 millimeter snare, you might head, hit other parts of the heart that you don't want to hit. And that's why I like to use a 10 millimeter snare, not a 15, not a 20, 
for two reasons. The 10 millimeter snare is the only one that you can push through a five French catheter. And the five French catheter semi curved will give me direction, right? I can guide, I can move that snare. And the second reason is that the smaller the target, the more precise you have to be to reach there. Instead of having a 20 millimeters in the right atrium, you might go through the sinusoidal, uh, not sinusoidal, sorry, for the, from through the uh, uh, node. And then you have a situation like this when the patient was having a systole. Gotcha. Thanks for explaining those two, those two points about the snare size um, and directionality. So is it a case-by-case basis that you decide to recan from the above or the below, or do you always start with one? Totally case-by-case. Case. I always inject contrast, as I mentioned, to, to the, the current technique is part the catheter in both sides after we fail the attempt with conventional technique, both sides, and then do a good combeam CT to understand the both sides, and then we plan accordingly. If I can't choose to come from above, I prefer to come from above because of the heartbeat. But sometimes uh, you try, you go from above and you fail. You, you, you can't reach the target. After trying one or two times, I give up on that. I come from the other side. And typically, we are able to successfully accomplish it. That's amazing. You do some amazing work. Um, I know this is a, a really difficult procedure. It's hair-raising to push a a uh, hot wire through high rent real estate. <laughs> and um, and the techniques that you've described um, and the tips you've given during this podcast will hopefully help our listeners be more confident using this technique. Are there anything else that you'd like to, to tell our audience, which is mostly interventional radiologists, vascular surgeons, cardiologists, trainees, techs, any other pieces of advice for operators who would like to start using the RF wire and the sniper technique? I think it's just uh, try to use a technique carefully and plan the case ahead of time. I, I spend a lot of time reviewing the anatomy up front before asking for the r r uh, RF wire out of the shelf. I plan a lot, and, and that's what I think is an emphasis. It, one thing I'd like to emphasize here is plan ahead of time, make sure you understand the anatomy well, the, the, the tissues around the, the segment that is occluded, and do everything you can to protect your patients. Awesome. Did we cover everything you wanted to talk about, Dr. Grimares? I think so. Ali, it was an was a honor being here. Thank you for the opportunity, and it's great to see you. Yeah, take care. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, Design and Digital Marketing, led by Brian Schmitz. Social Media and PR by Anne Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sabli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening.